Welcome. We are so glad that you're here this evening. My name is Laura Ferguson, and I'm the Senior Curator of Western History at the High Desert Museum. I'd like to begin tonight's program by acknowledging that the High Desert Museum is on Indigenous land. This is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Warm Springs, Wasco, and Paiute people. It was and is a crossroads, a place that many tribes, including the Klamath, Nez Perce, Umatilla, and Yakima people traveled through. It's important to acknowledge this in order to honor the ancestral and ongoing relationship between the land, plants, and animals, and the people who are indigenous to this place. It's also important to recognize the sovereignty of the hundreds of Indian tribes and nations that exist today within the United States, and to recognize that many of their citizens are living here today. I am so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, Nephi Craig and Sanjay Rao. Nephi is currently having some technical difficulties and hopefully will be joining the call soon. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and introduce both of tonight's panelists. Nephi Craig is White Mountain Apache and the founder of the Native American Culinary Association, a network of native cooks, chefs, scholars, farmers, and community members devoted to the development and preservation of Native American foodways. And as many of you saw, his story is featured in Gather. Sanjay is the director of Gather and a James Beard award-winning filmmaker. His previous films include Food Chains, which chronicled the battle of a group of indigenous farm workers in Florida against the largest agribusiness conglomerates in the world. Sanjay's last film, 3,100 Run and Become won several festival prizes and had a robust theatrical release in the US and is now opening across Europe and Australia. I am so pleased that our speakers could join us this evening. And again, we're hopeful that, that Nephi will be able to hop on soon. To those of you in the audience, I hope you've had a chance to watch Gather. If not, you'll be able to watch it for a few more weeks through the link that we sent when you registered for tonight's program. We'll begin tonight's program with a few questions that I've prepared for Sanjay and Nephi, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box. If you bump into any technical challenges, please feel free to reach out to us through the chat feature and we'll do our best to help. So with that, I'd love to get started. Sanjay, will you start off by catching us up um, and sharing with us what's happened since filming wrapped up and what this year of COVID has been like? For sure. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, Nephi should be able to join soon. He's uh, based in Eastern Arizona and I'm pretty sure he's having some, some serious bandwidth issues out on the res there. Um, the film Gather began in earnest in 2017. We met Sammy Jensaw and Twyla Casador and Nephi Craig um, separately and decided that it would, you know, that they would form a, a great trio of, of stories for the film. We ended up meeting Elsie Dubray in 2018 and we finished most of the filming of Gather in early 2019. But Nephi's Cafe still hadn't opened yet. You know, if anybody's ever tried to uh, remodel a home and knows what it's like dealing with multiple contractors, you know, you know that sometimes things can get delayed. So we didn't get to film Nephi's Cafe opening until late January, early February of 2020. But as everyone knows, by middle to late March, most of America had begun shutting down and it became clear that much of Indian country, particularly the Navajo Reservation and White Mountain Apache and San Carlos Apache Reservations were being hit very, very hard. So that the cafe shuttered really before it got to push past the, the stage of a soft open. And although life is getting to be a little bit more back to normal on White Mountain Apache, the cafe is still not open. And hopefully by the summer, once all social distancing rules are are uh, relaxed and once everybody gets vaccinated, that cafe will be open. Elsie, we finished filming her at the end of her senior year. And now, believe it or not, she's entering into her junior year at Stanford. Uh, Sammy Jensaw and his group of friends, uh, the Ancestral Guard, you know, they live seven hours away, as you guys know, from San Francisco by car up on uh, 
you know, on below Crescent City um, in Northern California and, you know, five, six hours away from Portland, a really long ways away from the supply chain. And when COVID hit there, it wasn't unlike, you know, some of the more extreme rural areas on the Navajo Reservation or Pine Ridge, groceries just stopped getting delivered. And with the lockdown and the fear of losing elders, many of the older generation, you know, remained confined at home. And so the tribe had some serious issues on how to get access to fresh and healthy fruits and vegetables. They're not a farming people, but Sammy and his cohort began a farm and they ended up planting 90 gardens all around the lower part of the reservation to be able to have a constant supply of food. And so their food sovereignty work has kind of been accelerated due to the necessity of the pandemic. Um, Twyla, Nephi, they've also experienced a lot more interest on the reservation uh, for rebuilding some of the systems that they've started to build themselves. Thank you. I really appreciate those updates. And how did it shape your work and some of the filming projects that you had underway? Well, you know, it was an absolute honor for me to be a part of this film. Um, a little history of documentary filmmaking. The, actually, the first documentary film ever made was made by an Anglo-American named Robert Flaherty in 1929. And it was called Nanook of the North. I mean, by all accounts, that film was done in close collaboration with the Indian North. But I think it's, it's clear that some sort of economic means, the ability to get a camera and buy a plane ticket, began flying all over the place and telling stories of, of people some of which were done again with the, with the cooperation of local people and some of which weren't, but we're at a stage where the majority of indigenous children watch films about their people made by non-indigenous people. And we all know the, the Hollywood stereotypes of natives as savages and natives as the, the antithesis to the capitalist you know, conquest of the West, but it's not any better in documentary. And so I, I wouldn't have dared make a film about Indian country had it not been for a close partnership with a group out of Colorado called the First Nations Development Institute. I mean, it would have taken me years to gain the trust to Nephi Twyla or Sammy and his, and his cohort, uh, much less be able to include all of them in a film. Um, Elsie too, of course. Um, so it was really because of that friendship and partnership that we were able to like launch into this project. And my goal as a filmmaker is always to make the cast the portray the cast as the experts that they are. And so even though there's a lot of great native food sovereignty professionals and professors and lawyers, you know, we gave space to our characters to tell their story. So this isn't by any means a uh, a compendium on what food sovereignty is to all tribal nations. There's 574 federally recognized ones in the 50 states, but hopefully it gives a window into what's going on in Indian country and um, inspires those in and outside of Indian country about the necessity to think about what food sovereignty means in your community. I really appreciate you sharing that about how you went about partnering and also your emphasis on really having the culture and knowledge holders kind of be the experts and, and that really came through nicely in the in the film. Sanjay, I'm curious what drew you to tell this story. That's a great question. You know, my very first documentary was released in 2014. It was called Food Chains about a group of migrant farm workers. in Southern Fully workers. They're at a Seminole town called Immokalee, but this town has been featured in films all, all, all the way back to Edward R. back in 19... Uh, the, the predicament for, for migrant farm workers then, ma the majority of whom were poor whites and poor blacks in the South. Uh, the film Harvest of Shame really catalyzed a lot of action in the Senate, but not much had changed in reality across 40 years. 
until the CIW came along and realized the problem wasn't at the farming level in terms of better pay. It was really at the top of the chain, the large buyers, like the Taco Bells, the large buyers of the, the produce they were picking, which are tomatoes, like the Taco Bells, McDonald's, the Safeways, the Kroger's, the Walmarts, the Costco's of the world. And so, you know, I went into that project wanting to kind of do a human rights film about the exploitation of farm work, but it really was a supply chain film. And it really got me interested in the structures behind our capitalist system. Now, it, it led me to gather in the sense that, you know, the modern food system was only uh, created with the advent of the technology of large ships in the 1400s. I mean, there was trading, of course, along the Silk Road, and there were conquests to get people to grow non-perishable taxable goods like wheat. But the rest of the food system was what you could grow and maybe cart on a, uh, on a horse buggy. Um, but when the Spaniards came to the New World, they obviously they came here accidentally, but they came with a mandate to extract the value of topsoil, to, to go to the Spice Islands and really take all the spices they could by force. When they came to Turtle Island, they kind of got mired in looking for gold, but the Anglo-Americans realized the value in the incredibly complicated and incredibly wealthy farming communities on the Eastern seaboard. I mean, that's why they were able to, in a matter of a decade, you know, create a gigantic cash juggernaut for tobacco, for cotton, for other cash crops, for timber and to establish the American economy as something that was land-based, which was the reason why it pushed westward. But as we know, with the advent of roads and you know, railways and refrigerated cars, that same ethos existed of going to some place that offered, in this case, food at a very low cost, that if shipped, you would add value tremendously and sell for an incredibly high price. So you no longer needed to take tobacco across the ocean to Europe. You could take tomatoes and lettuce from the Central Valley in California and ship it to the East Coast and make a gigantic premium. Now you can take it 60 miles away to the Bay Area and make a gigantic premium. So that idea of taking resources, water and soil, combining it into food, shipping it somewhere and creating a, a tremendous amount of profit is what our country is really optimized for. That said, it's like we see the ramifications of that system. You know, you see it in Oregon, particularly in southeastern Oregon, or along the Klamath River, where people were promised free water to farm in perpetuity. In hindsight, you know, that wasn't necessarily the most ecologically sound decision. And the way we've dammed rivers, the way we filled the ground with chemical fertilizers and pesticides for yearly profits is not necessarily the way that our country, it's an understanding of our symbiosis with our environment and the reality that we're going to be here for a very long time, not just a quarterly, you know, profit and loss cycle. You perhaps just answered my next question, but I'm still curious to hear you reflect on what do you hope viewers will most take away from Gather? You know, what is the thing that you most want people to understand or to continue to think and learn about? I, I'm going to channel, you know, Nephi and Sammy and Twyla on this one. Uh, number one, we made the we made the movie for Indian Country as something to generate interest to revitalize the wisdom, the culture around food. There's tons of people in Indian country doing incredible work. And the film is really just a tool for them to inspire their community if needed. But we've been surprised and heartened by the amount of interest outside of Indian country. I'm obviously a different kind of Indian. I'm a, I'm a second generation immigrant here to the US. And, you know, in a sense, we are all benefiting from not just the, the, the kind of distant care that natives, you know, felt and, and conducted and had and have for the land that we are now on, but the science 
you know, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, as those of you who saw gather, 70% of the global food system, including foods that I thought were indigenous in India, like peppers and potatoes and tomatoes, turn out not to be so. It's like the whole world has benefited from thousands of years of science that took place on Turtle Island and in the Western Hemisphere. You know, the river systems, the, the ecological purity that drew settlers and drew people from all walks of life to the United States wasn't something that happened by accident. You know, it wasn't wilderness, it was stewardship. And so as we grapple with climate change and the rapidly deteriorating environment around us, you know, I think we can look to those who stewarded the land for solutions rather than those, and I'm included in this, rather than those who helped to create the problems. I mean, it doesn't really make much logical sense for the people that created the problems to also be depended on for the solutions when the solutions exist within the communities that were colonized and usurped by the new occupants of that land. So I think at the end of the day, people who watch Gather realize if they hadn't already, and this is really kind of just a generalization, that natives are still here and that perhaps learning about the policies that local tribes are trying to enact um, for their successive generations, five, six, seven, ten down the line, will help us think a lot more broadly in terms of what types of solutions we actually need to have. We shouldn't look at five-year goals or 10-year goals. It's that same thinking that got us into this problem. You know, we really need to figure out how to look out, you know, with a hundred year, 500 year timeline. I really appreciate that perspective. I think that's so important to keep in mind. Sovereignty is an idea that is so important and perhaps not very well understood. So I wondered if you might share a little bit about what food sovereignty means and how food sovereignty relates to other kinds of sovereignty like political sovereignty. Sure, I mean, we can look at it in terms of non-native community. I live in New York, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. You began to realize that the food providers that you knew were the ones that were a lot more reliable. Like the Trader Joe's, the Costco's, they didn't have any sort of mechanism to deliver food to elderly people who didn't want to leave the house because of COVID. It was the tiny little co-ops and the natural food stores that really had that sort of ethos that stretched beyond thinking in dollars and cents. At the same time, we know that a lot of the money we put into the cheap food system goes into other people's pockets and we end up bearing the costs of it in the long run, you know, through increased taxes, through all of the environmental issues. Um, but we're okay with that because it's less work for us to do. Like we'd rather not go out and farm a field if we can buy cheap tomatoes picked by low wage labor in a part of the world that we never have to see. But I think we're beginning to realize that being engaged in the local food system means being engaged with the local environment. You begin to care more about water issues, air issues, other sorts of climate related issues when you know that it'll affect the food system that sustains you. You'll have more of a stake in it. And it's not just the farms, but it's making sure that everybody who's involved in giving you food or providing you food, whether it's fresh food or cooked food, is living a happy and healthy life. Because we also know that when people aren't living a happy and healthy life, and the, the pandemic was, was a great example, when people can't show up to work because they're sick, we can no longer get food. And there's no if, ands, and buts around that. And when that happens, communities lose access to this massive supply chain that's supposed to be running 24 seven. We know now that it doesn't run 24 seven. It might run 24 seven if someone is in the top 1%, but if you're not in the top 1%, there's no security that you have in the system. And so that's the differential. It's like, there's a concept called food security, which means having constant access to calories. But we know that there really is no such thing as food security. We saw it. 
what we need to push towards is food sovereignty and using your power, not as a consumer, but as a citizen to change local policy, to enable local gardens, to enable local environmental education, to make it easier for farmers to get access to markets, to make it easier for farmers to charge more so they can make a good living, to make sure that people within the food system, whether they're meat packers or servers at restaurants, earn a living wage. When, when that happens, then we control our food system. And when you control your food system, you have so much more power, you know, because you know everybody, you've got relationships with everybody in your community. And lastly, because if there's anything that binds us all together, it's food, water, and air. And we're not really that clued in or that conscious of any of those things as normal consumers. We need to exercise our power as citizens to become a part of that system and to have control of that system if we want to have a little bit more say in our kind of environmental quality of life. Absolutely, thank you. I'm curious, one of the things I really appreciated in the film is the way that you wove together people's individual kind of personal histories and their dedication and you know commitment to food sovereignty and the ways that that was inspiring them to be involved in this work and so I wondered if you might just um, share a little bit about kind of how and why those kind of personal stories um, you know kind of how you wove together kind of people's biographies with you know this broader um, broader movement this is more of kind of like a, a, a movie a filmmaking centric question for me because you know, the question I always ask myself in starting a film project is like, why is this a film? Like, why isn't this a book? Um, there's different kinds of media. Some stories are better suited for other forms of media. I mean, it's, it's not to throw shade on like talking head documentaries, but at the same time, a lot of those talking head documentaries are just like lazy ways to kind of get around reading a book. Um, so here, the idea was make it visual, make it emotional. And in a sense, it's like if you were doing a fiction movie, you would cast for your characters. You'd do like casting calls. You'd have actors or actresses read for certain parts uh, to see if they fit the role that you needed. So with, with this, obviously, it's not scripted. But we, I very much was looking at people based on their ability to kind of have the sort of charisma that a camera likes. I mean, you know, like when you look at it, like through a magazine or like online or on Instagram, there are people of all shapes and sizes that can really take good photographs or, may, or be good subjects in photographs. Like they've got something where they, they can look right through the camera and make you through your phone feel something. And so when I first met Sammy and his brothers, it's like they reminded me of that 80s movie Stand By Me, where you go like, I don't really know what happened in that movie, but like it was really entertaining. And seeing these young men and, and a few young women at the very, very beginning of their journey had so much fresh energy. So it was like, we, we want to film them. We want to create a story based around what they're doing. You know, when we met Twyla, it was the same thing. You know, like you could watch her. I could watch her through a lens or through a camera endlessly. She didn't have to talk. Like just walking with her through fields and seeing how she kind of interacted with the environment around her was, was very visual to me. And the same thing with Nephi and Elsie, like they had a, uh, a presence, I should say, that wasn't intimidated by the camera or they were their true selves. And you can kind of feel that through the film. So, you know, First Nations Development Institute help us, helped us find people that were pillars or budding pillars of the movement. So we didn't really worry about like the, the, the resumes of the, the folks we were meeting. It was more like, you know, will these folks really be able to communicate the incredible dedication they have um, on film? And so that, that was kind of it. I mean, granted, like there was a, an academic approach, you know, we, again, we're trying to make something visual and pre 1870, there really were, are no visuals other than a few paintings here and there. Mm -hmm. so we couldn't really look at the devastation of colonization on the East Coast or even in like 
much of the, the, the Midwest east of the Mississippi. We really had to look at, at tribal nations and communities west of the Mississippi. So that, that was the first kind of filter. Mm -hmm. Well, that really brings me to the next thing that I wanted to ask you. Um, and before I jump into that question, I will mention to those of you at home, if you do have questions for Sanjay, please feel free to put them in the, the Q&A after this question. We'll turn it over to, to all of your questions. One of the other things that I really appreciated about the film and about your work is the way that you connected processes of colonization and resistance in the past to what's going on today. And you drew some really clear lines um, between, for example, genocide in the past and genocide today. And so I wondered if you might comment just a little bit more on how you see similarities from, I think sometimes people tend to think of colonization or genocide as process as things that were going on in the past. So why was it important to you to kind of connect it to today? And where do you see some of those key similarities and differences? In my own opinion, and I think this is the opinion of some of the producers of the film too, you know, devastation and genocide is maybe masked by race, but it's economic. And you see it all over this country. You know, it's not just happening to minorities, it's happening to people who have access to resources that the system values. So farmers in Nebraska are losing their land and you know, native peoples are aligning with them. There's a, a, a curiously named movement called the Cowboys and Indians movement in Nebraska where natives and farmers are teaming up to start stop large scale uh, pipeline development and the seizure of their land by eminent domain. Um, so it's like at the end of the day, you know, capitalism, and the kind of global military strength was really developed through tactics that were learned in Indian country, um, moving natives away from prime waterways, starving populations to subjugate warriors, asymmetrical warfare without losing. But at the end of it, natives are still here. And they're sort of like the original resistance against this new form of extractive capitalism. And a lot of indigenous people, a lot of peasant people around the world have come to the US or have met indigenous North Americans to learn those tactics. And now a lot of urban communities, a lot of rural Caucasian communities are learning the tactics of fighting against you know, corporate takeovers. Because in a sense, it's like, the genocide that's happening to Native Americans right now isn't because of the military like it was 120 years ago. It's not even really, you know, because of a single force. It's a system that was put in place driven by economics and by government policy that is trying to literally destroy Native health. The end goal, who knows, but on Twyla's land, when one of the places that we filmed Twyla, the, the last few shots of the film where she's talking about how Mother Earth's heart is beating, that's on a sacred Apache ground called Oak Flat, a high mesa. Apparently, one of the largest untapped copper reserves in the world lies underneath there. And so it's very likely that the Apache people are going to lose access to that holiest of holy lands because of the national good and the necessity of copper to, you know, to, to, to power all of our electronics. You know, at the same time, we might get the copper, but we don't get the profits. Like the profits are all going into the hands of shareholders of, of those large companies. But you see that across the country and you see large takeovers of land and the destruction of lifestyle so that very few people can profit. And those few people have also bankrolled a lot of the political power that enables this. So if you look at the health outcomes in Indian country, it's no different from the health outcomes of rural America that depend on Dollar General. It's no different from the health outcomes of inner city areas that, can't have, that don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. 
So the idea of food sovereignty, the ongoing genocide through the destruction of our health is something very real. And so like this redevelopment of food systems that we, we kind of try to chronicle and gather is happening all around the country in small communities that realize that they are their only lifeline. Um, so hopefully that sort of message becomes more and more powerful and local communities like Bend and others realize that with a little bit of community effort, you can take control over your food system and you can you know, really provide a stopgap against future disruptions of the supply chain. Most of us haven't seen a disruption like COVID-19 in terms of food access, but we all see now that if it happens one or two more times in our lifetime, you know, you can start to see the fabric of society really start to break down. Absolutely. Not a very inspiring thing to say, sorry. No, but an important message to share. A question from an audience member is, about the, what are some of the other stories that you hope to share through the documentary? Are there other groups that you thought about including in Gather or are there kind of key stories you wanted to share that you ended up cutting um, for, for length? Great question. I mean, the, the only way I can really answer that is that there is a story like those happening in Gather in everyone's backyard. Mm -hmm. Number one, and, and this is not, directed towards Lacey. Lacey probably already knows this, but number one, look up the tribes in your area and look up their environmental policies and begin to might apply to you as well. Like, like the Standing Rock Sioux uh, tribe and, and their fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline. You know, it wasn't just because a pipeline burst, uh, breakage, spillage might besmirch their land, but they're sitting at the top of the Missouri River watershed. And a spill anywhere along that river would affect millions of people down there. And so once the greater portion of, of mainstream America began to realize that, they began to understand why lots of natives and activists were gathering to try to block a pipeline by force. And so it's an easy way to extrapolate. You know, Sammy and, and all the tribes on the Klamath River that were trying to create a better water policy realized that the dams were the antithesis to a healthy river, healthy forests, healthy systems. Obviously, it's like farms that were created in the last 100 and 150 years, both in southeastern Oregon and in the Central Valley of California, have to now reimagine their farming future in terms of how they're going to use water. That causes a lot of short-term pain even generational pain, but we can see how that's the inevitable necessity if we're trying to look a hundred years in the future. And so chances are your local tribe is going to be working on issues that are of critical importance to you, no matter how far away um, you think those issues are. Um, so that, that, that's what I would say. It's like, those stories are all around. Yeah. And that was the difficulty of, in this film. It's like, we had to do a film on food sovereignty and in Native American food sovereignty, but there's really you know, no such thing as Native American food sovereignty. Each community has its own tenet of food sovereignty, its own understanding of land, its own knowledge of land and place. And those of us who, you know, have access to the internet can discover that that exists, you know, right around the corner from you as well. Another question just came in. Um, commenting on how much they loved the statement, the industrial revolution is over, it's time for the restorative revolution. Can you tell me who said that? And um, can you speak a little bit, Sanjay, to why, why that was important, why you wanted to include that idea? For sure, and, and just as no, Nephi might be punching in in just a second. Terrific. Uh, so yeah, Sammy Jensaw is an amazing young man. You know, he has a, a very, very big heart. 
th this is kind of his story, so interpretation necessarily. But you know, people on reservations are living w just miles away from people who killed their grandparents. Like, you know, the border areas around reservations can be some of the most devastatingly brutal areas for Native Americans. And at the same time, Sammy's feeling is that, you know, like, like he, he and his, his, his cohorts are, understand, you know, the source of, of oh, wait, I'll, I'll, I'll shut up for a second because Nephi's here. Hey, Nephi. I think you're on mute. Hey, what's up? Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I apologize. I was uh, delayed and had real kind of crummy service, but I'm here. Oh, no problem. It's it's just great to see you. Um, <laughs> Sanjay's been sharing a lot of, of information and, and also caught us up a little bit on what's happened, you know, since filming finished. But I think we'd all love to hear from you, too, sure. about this last year and kind of what you've been up to. Okay. Um, just as it relates to just in general or the cafe too or everything relating. Um, well, uh, um, this year has been really challenging. Uh, when you when you get to uh, see the film, the, uh, the the part that you see in the film was the soft opening activities that we had, and just within a few weeks after that, the um, um, the Arizona governor mandated the shutdown, and in our area it hit us too, so we started shutting everything down. So for the past year, programs, and but uh, what's been really cool to see is that um, like during last summer, we saw a lot more people doing socially distancing, uh, gathering wild foods, and. Uh, um, so that was something neat. And I saw that a lot in, in my social media feeds and was hearing a lot from other community members. So kind of uh, when the pressure hit, people kind of resorted to that ancestral knowledge, you know? Um, so it, it's, it's been a tough year, but we're definitely resilient and our communities are doing okay um vaccinations and a lot of the um a lot of the social distancing measures our community is really uh, adhered to so we're really able to kind of get it um much more manageable than it was in the past so we seem to be things are looking up Thank you. Um, you're coming in a little bit fuzzy, but I think we were able to hear most of what you said. And I'm so glad to hear that, you know, amidst this really difficult time that there have also been you know, moments of resilience and continuing on with, with your work. And Sanjay, I know you had been, when Nephi was able to hop in, commenting on the restorative revolution. So I'd love to go back to kind of hearing, hearing what you were saying there. Yeah, you know, so something Sammy said is that, you know, the areas around his reservation, you know, are, are populated by, by people whose ancestors literally took the lives of his. And Sammy says that he and his cohort on the res understand that. And they're, they're able to, to deal with the hatred in their hearts and, and turn that into something positive. But he said, a lot of the people on the other side whose ancestors were the ones who inflicted the damage haven't come to terms with that. And he said, like, in his, in his viewpoint, they're both dealing with the same historical trauma. And it's time that everyone kind of realizes that they're not responsible for the sins of their ancestors and that they have to find ways to, to move together, move forward together. Because as, as, as you guys know, if you know about the, the, the Klamath River issues, like farmers, natives from four tribes, a lot of different people who people never thought would see eye to eye all came together with the shared goal of restoring the Klamath River. Different ideas on execution, but they were able to give each other respect and mitigate, you know, 
that any feelings of hatred and understand everyone's own or differing stakes in, in, in the process. It's something that I still kind of find hard to fathom, but you know, Sammy says it that clearly and uh, hopefully I'll become as good of a person as he is one of these days. Nephi, one of the things I really appreciated, and, and Sanjay commented a little bit on this, about the way that in the film, each person's individual story was really highlighted alongside the, the work that, that you all are doing. And I really appreciated the ways that you opened up and shared your own history. So I wondered if you might share a little bit about why your own journey and some of the challenges you faced are so important to the work you're doing today and why it felt important to you to include that piece of the story. Okay, uh, I just turned off my video. Maybe you can hear me a little better. Yes, that's great. Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I definitely think when it comes to this type of work, uh, I think it's really essential that people do their best to lead by example uh, because it is so rigorous. Um, you do have to um, really kind of engage the work. And I've been saying recently, when it comes to the food sovereignty work, when you first get like uh, tuned on to it or introduced to it, it's really filled with a lot of uh, mystique and mystery. And it seems like a really cool, radical thing to be involved in. And then um, that it once, once, once you get into that phase of it, I feel like if you really get into the work and work really diligently, that mystique and um, that aspect of it begins to wear away and you really see whether or not the work is for you. And so it's kind of like working past the, the romantic notions of food sovereignty mm -hmm. to get to the core because at the core, it's just as heavy and it's probably just as more rigorous. So for, for me in my own practice, all the tools that I've learned to kind of help me stay sober or clean, all those mental health themes and then also the um, the, the cultural and familial concepts kind of all kind of come together and create the, the, the foundation that I stand on. And I feel like a lot of other Native peoples and people in general um, have those same potential to do that. So that, that's why I feel like it's really, it was really important to share that in the film and to um, be vulnerable and be open to talking about it uh, so that, you know, hopefully we can help to um, contribute to the de to destigmatizing mental health and recovery. I really appreciate you sharing that. And that absolutely feels like an important piece and, and, and your willingness to share your history and story really um, can be so helpful then to so many other people. A question that Sanjay touched on, but I'd love to hear from your perspective is, you know, what are you most hoping that those who see the movie Gather will take away from the film? What do you most want people to continue to think and learn about? I, I really hope people can, can uh, continue to think about um, food access and activating that, uh, those themes at their homes and in their personal lives first, um, that this, this work really requires action. It really requires more than um, simple land acknowledgements or social media activism. It really requires people to engage and make a long-term commitment. So um, if, if, any, if anyone take, if, if, if there's any takeaways from the film that will last with people, I hope it's the, um, re the resilience and the strength of native communities mm -hmm. and how hard so many um, unnamed and anonymous people are working right now. In that film, we're just a microcosm of Indian country. There are so many other uh, native peoples of all ages that are engaged in something related to food sovereignty, whether it's policy, uh, health, public health, law enforcement, or even in school meals, um, uh, elder feeding sites and that kind of thing. Um, just know that the, it's, it's um, way, more, um, from, may, way more than just the film. It's way more than just a phenomenon. Uh, it's definitely not a trend and it's definitely a way of life for, for us that are uh, deep in the work. So, um, but, but I really hope that it was, it touched and kind of really validated your own experience in a very human way mm -hmm. that we have more in common than we think. Mm -hmm. And when we can, we can kind of divert uh, resources to the people that need it um, because um, it's necessary. So 
um, I really hope that that um, provides some hope and some optimism as we move into a post-pandemic world um, so that we just don't let all the pressures uh, and consciousness that came from the pandemic to fade away. Uh, it's like the, the iron is hot right now and we have an opportunity to strike and mold a future with more health consciousness. So I hope that kind of contributes to the answer or helps to answer it. Absolutely, thank you. As a final question for you both, as we conclude tonight's program, I'd love to leave our audience with an action that they might take, something that they could do. Is there an action that you would want to leave everyone with or something that you hope that they will, will do after seeing Gather and hearing our discussion tonight? I'll, I'll leave that to you, Nifa, because like that, you're, you're going to bring a lot more of that answer than me. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I definitely hope that um, people can begin to build healthy and ethical relationships with um, the BIPOC community and uh, Native communities, because there's, there's no reason that we should be considered food deserts, and there's no reason that we should be at the end of a supply chain when it comes to food. There's really no reason that we should be under so many layers of oppression as native peoples in our communities. And there's no reason that we should be um, so invisible. Um, so I would really help that ask or hope that people can take action by sharing the work of other native peoples and crediting them along the way, amplifying the voices that are um, that um, amplifying our voices because there are many, there are thousands of practitioners in the food sovereignty movement and the food sovereignty work and really um, continue to support the film and share it with people of all ages, try to get it into schools and talk about it in curriculum and really take a stark look at the true history of, of the United States from, from an indigenous perspective. And, um, you know, keep cooking and following the cultivars because those are really truth tellers. So um, I really hope that uh, that answers it. And uh, thanks for taking the time and, and, you know, allowing me to be on today and, and share a piece of my perspective. And I'm really happy that you supported the film. Thank you so much, Sanjay and Nephi, for joining us tonight. Thank you for creating this film and for sparking all of this really important conversation. And um, I just really appreciate you both um, sharing your insights and your, your beautiful land and views with us, Nephi. That's gorgeous. Um, so anyway, thank you both so much. And thank you to all of our, all of those, all of you at home um, for taking part in this evening's program. Have a great rest of your night. Uh, 